if you can't see or hear anything. <laughs> um, so what I would like to talk uh, with you all today about is how biology uses physics to sculpt complex shapes. And we have this delightful introduction um, already in the first talk about uh, this idea of looking at uh, mechanical perspective on morphogenesis. Um, here I want to focus in on, on specifically uh, looking at how an organ can take form. And so in this video, you'll see that this organ is undergoing complex shape transformations during development. And this is happening deep inside a living embryo. And so what we'll do is we'll trace the dynamics of this process from the whole organ scale to the tissue scale to the cellular behaviors that are um, underlying this process. And what we'll find is that there is a calcium mediated mechanical program that encodes 3D shape. So when we think about morphogenesis very broadly, um, morphogenesis is about the dynamics of geometry in biological systems. And much of the best work done uh, in this topic analyzes confined or static surfaces um, and often very simple geometries, which is to their credit because then we can really make a lot of traction. But at the same time, there are also all of these other systems that really get to the heart of, of what morphogenesis is about by studying tissues that, that change shape in 3D, uh, such as visceral organs. And here, cells arrange into tube-like sheets, which further deform into, say, coils of compartments. And this is the case, for instance, in the development of our hearts. Um, the human heart, which transforms from a simple tube into a, a, a core that folds then into a coil of compartments. Now, accessing these visceral organ systems is difficult um, for several reasons. They develop deep inside living embryos. So we have to do deep tissue imaging on, unless we can take them out and, and culture them. Uh, real organs have complex shapes, which preclude simple interpretations of their dynamics. And moreover, they consist of multiple tissue layers and these multiple tissue layers will interact um, in order to sculpt themselves into those complex shapes. So for these reasons, we need a model system to address this question of how visceral organs take form. And we envision the fly midgut, which is um, sketched here in red, as a new model system for a quantitative approach to organogenesis. Um, now, the description of this organ's morphogenesis is, uh, in terms of its shape and its shape transformation, is quite limited. I know there are some people here on this call who have spent a lot of time looking and done a lot of actually wonderful work on uh, midgut morphogenesis and a lot of the bio biological uh, mechanisms that at play. But here I want to focus in on how we can, um, we can mechanically um, create these shape transformations. And so this part is, is quite limited and this makes sense because it's for all these reasons we said before, deep inside, uh, and the shape is complex. But using light sheet microscopy and genetically induced clearing techniques, we can peer now deep inside and specifically label these gut cells. So here, these are all nuclei of this multi-layer sheet of cells. And we can view the entire organ in 3D with subcellular resolution through, throughout the, uh, the course of development. So this is the same organ. I'm just showing two different views. Um, of this panoramic data set. And so from movies such as this, we can find that there are actually no cells, uh, no signs of cell division throughout this process. So it seems this is not a system where growth leads to, to form, for uh, in the sense that there's no cell proliferation, but instead it's a system where tissue deformation leads to form. So our goal then is to understand how coordinated tissue deformations can generate 3D shape change in the system, and ultimately to understand the cellular mechanisms behind those deformations. So to begin, we must first capture the dynamics of this tissue and these cells on this evolving surface. So how do we do that? How do we make sense of this, this 3D data with these complex shapes? Well, to capture the shape, we borrow from computer vision community. Uh, to automatically segment the inside surface of this organ. 
Now we have a segmentation, and now we can track that its evolution over time, again, automatically. So this gives us the ability uh, not only to capture the shape, but also to image specific layers of the tissue. So we can project data on specific uh, surfaces. And here on the right, uh, this video is showing the inner endodermal layer. Using these extracted shapes, we, we can see clearly now that a, a constriction forms in the middle of the organ, and then two more that subdivide the gut into four chambers. It's really only after this time that we have these constrictions that the gut begins to coil into a chiral shape. So that suggests that there are really two stages of development here, folding, then coiling. And this interpretation is borne out quantitatively um, in, in measurements of the geometry. For instance, uh, here in purple is the surface area. And the surface area grows during the first hour, which corresponds to the folding, hour to 70 minutes and before plateaus during this coiling phase. We can also, uh, meanwhile, the, the volume uh, changes only gradually uh, throughout this process. And meanwhile, we can also ask about the length of the, length of the organ as characterized by a, a center line in brown, and also the chirality of this center line um, measured by the writhe of this curve. And there in blue, we find that uh, the writhe really deviates from zero only after we have completed uh, the folding stage of morphogenesis. So here in this talk, we'll focus on uh, how this organ folds into these chambers, how it forms these constrictions. And with these global measurements in hand, we can now move into the tissue frame of reference and see how the tissue is deforming, how that relates to this global shape. And to do that, we created a new method. What we do is we cut the organ along its length and we map uh, the embedded image into the plane for analysis um, in this process that, that we dubbed tubular and we'll make that available uh, short, uh, soon. We're trying to get it packaged up. Um, and so this mapping preserves uh, useful features for analyzing elongated tissue geometries. And it also offers a global coordinate system, a, a cylindrical-like coordinate system that generalizes for complex shapes. So with this mapping in hand, we can map to a canonical domain throughout the time course of, of development. And then we can ask, how do these pullback images uh, move around in plane and relate that to uh, their motion in 3D space? So in this way, we can really probe the tissue velocity um, and transform these images into three-dimensional flow fields. Here I'm, I'm plotting the tangential component of that flow field with the orientation in color and the magnitude in opacity. And we can ask, how do these in-plane tissue velocities, these complex swirls that arise, relate to the out-of-plane deformations we see on the left, these constrictions? So despite the complex swirling motions that we were just seeing, there is actually a, a simple relation here. The folding onset of these constrictions is accompanied by sinks in the tangential velocity field. And strikingly, this in-plane motion looks very similar to the out-of-plane motion coupled to mean curvature. So this is H here is the mean curvature of the surface, and Vn is the motion in the, uh, the normal direction, out-of-plane direction. Now, the difference between these two fields physically uh, corresponds to local changes in area of the tissue or, or cells area cha uh, change. And this difference is small compared to either. So that means that uh, the in-plane and the out-of-plane motion are matched with something like 97, 98% correlation. And this signals an, an effective tissue incompressibility, 2D incompressibility of the tissue during this uh, development. This is true at early times as shown in the snapshots here. This is also true at late times in the snapshots here, once the constrictions are already quite deep. So the tissue behaves as a nearly incompressible tissue, uh, meaning that almost all dilatational flow couples directly to changes in curvature. If the initial geometry were flat, such as in, for instance, a piece of paper, uh, this could be a, about the end of the story. We have in-plane to out-of-plane coupling. But in fact, there is another ingredient, which is that the tissue is curved. So because this organ is curved like a cylinder, 
then area preserving constrictions mandate that while the circumferential length shortens or geodesics shorten, the longitudinal length, the longitudinal geodesics will elongate these orange ones. In other words, the tissue must shear in order to constrict. And we can see that directly by mapping out the fate of a tissue patch here, a rectangular tissue patch. Its circumferential uh, length in blue shrinks uh, while uh, flowing into the fold, but the longitudinal length in orange grows in order to preserve the tissue area. So in biology, we would call this convergent extension. And we mapped this out over the whole organ uh, in quantitative detail with, instead of showing that, I want to instead actually point out that we can also see this shear or this convergent extension reflect very well, faithfully in the shape of the endodermal cells. So during this time course, we start off with endodermal cells, which are highly elongated. Here, they're colored by their aspect ratio. And over time, near these constrictions, these, this aspect ratio decreases, and the cells become more and more isotropic. So we can measure that. Their aspect ratios here are going down towards one, which would be isotropic. And this is not due to cell uh, rotations, as the, uh, the orientations of these cells remain steady. So these cell shears work collectively, capturing most of the tissue scale shear that accompanies constrictions. So if we plot cell shear becoming more and more isotropic against the tissue shear undergoing conversion extension, um, we capture much of, of the de development, particularly at early times. So most of this uh, convergence extension is due uh, and can be explained by these, these cell shape changes. So in summary, we have this kinematic mechanism that helps us understand how we can link in-plane and out-of-plane motion using the incompressibility of the tissue plus its initial curvature. Well, that will link dilatational and out-of-plane deformations. And because of uh, the, the incompressibility, we'll link those two. And because of the initial curvature, that means that we get this convergent extension in a patterned way via these constrictions. Okay, so we've now moved from the organ scale to some cellular scale dynamics. What underlies these cell shape changes? What is actually going on biologically? What is actually going on physically? Now, this is a visceral organ. It has both an endodermal tissue layer and uh, a muscle layer in yellow. And, and also these, there are some elongated red muscle cells. So many things are possible, but um, there, there could be activity in, in one or both, or some sort of crosstalk between these two layers. In retrospect though, there is a clue, which is that the information patterning in the gut is mainly in the muscle. What do I mean by that? In particular, there are Hox genes, which are master regulatory transcription factors that are expressed in bands in the muscle layer. I mean, crucially, these genes are upstream of shape. If we knock out the antennapedia gene, we lose the anterior constriction. If we knock out the UBX gene, we lose the middle constriction. So this information is in the muscles. The muscles have some program for shape change encoded in them. Presumably they're inducing then the convergent extension motif in the endoderm that we saw before. But how are they doing that? Are they passing those instructions to the endoderm by a genetic induction of behavior? Or perhaps are they generating stress themselves, which is then passed to the endoderm through mechanical coupling, uh, illustrated here through an ECM and through integrins and in green and blue respectively in my cartoon. So we really weren't sure about which of these or both um, were happening. And we struggled with this for a while um, until the following experiments, which I think shed light on the, the primary uh, mechanism at play. So there are these, these are powerful tools available when you're working with flies. Um, there's one optogenetic tool that abolishes a cell's ability to contract by releasing the actomyosin anchor in the plasma membrane. And there's another which can induce contraction by recruiting ROGAF to the plasma membrane. So we can then introduce these tools specifically to target the contractility of the muscle layer and the muscle layer only. 
And we can also do it just in site-specific manner. So just these cyan muscle cells, which would uh, normally um, uh, uh, band the, the anterior constriction. So by inhibiting this muscle band from actively contracting, we can abolish the anterior fold. So this is a mechanical perturbation. I want to, to stress that this organ is wild type as far as the Hox genes are concerned, but by abolishing muscle contractility, we lose these constrictions. And conversely, we can induce the fold ectopically by stimulating muscle contraction at an earlier time. So all of this establishes that the muscle contraction is required and induce, inducing muscle contraction also induces a resulting fold. And we can go on to inhibit more posterior folds by uh, perturbing uh, posterior muscles in the organ, re dramatically reducing the, the posterior folds and slowing them down. This takes a long time for them to form or by uh, uh, dramatically changing the shape of the organ. So then how does the endoderm react? How, what is the coupling, the mechanical interaction or genetic interaction um, that results? So in wild type, we find that these two layers move together. Um, by analyzing movies in which both layers are labeled, we can see that the yellow cells, the yellow muscle cells, and the blue endodermal cells are, are co-moving. I can play that one more time. And so by looking at movies such as this, we can really confirm this, uh, this result that by tracking initially close pairs of cells in either layer, we see that for the most part, they move together and their relative motion here in blue is, um, is very weak compared to the overall motion of, uh, of the cells. So in the wild type, these layers are mechanically linked if uh, they're tethered together. And, and if we inhibit muscle contractility, then we might expect that the endodermal cell shapes will then stay fixed as opposed to undergoing their convergent extension. So we'd go in and, and measure this. We, we knock down the muscle contractility and uh, simultaneously segment the endodermal cell shapes. And we find that um, by reducing the muscle contraction, this removes the ability for the uh, endoderm to change shape. So we conclude that muscle activity induces these endodermal cell shape change in the wild type. And that's, we know already, linked to the organ constriction. And Interestingly, a genetic uh, mutant against a Hox gene, which also loses this fold, has qualitatively similar behavior. So this suggests to us that the Hox genes are really controlling muscle contraction in order to induce this convergent extension to fold. So if genes pattern muscle contraction to trigger endodermal cell shape change, uh, to trigger folding, well, what is the biological mechanism that they do, that they use? For instance, they could be modulating um, something about the actomyosin contractility like we were doing in the perturbations. But to, to our surprise, um, and per, uh, perhaps naively our surprise, the key player uh, in the endogenous program, it seems, is a pattern of high frequency calcium pulses. So here in this video, uh, anything that is in color is a transient pulse of calcium that floods uh, the cytoplasm of the visceral muscles of the circular muscles. So if there's something in red, uh, that means that it, it, there's a flash of calcium reporter uh, at, at one time, and then in the next uh, snapshot, it's no longer there. So it was transient flash on the time scale of seconds, similarly for green or blue. So uh, these, uh, this, these bands of calcium dynamics appear at this anterior constriction uh, during this fold. And we've gone in and, and measured each fold now. And um, strikingly, they, they all have this highly localized band of calcium pulses that specifically appears right at the onset of uh, constrictions. So this is a strong correlation, both in space and in time. And of course, we wanted to test whether this is causal. So we can test the hypothesis that it's causal by inhibiting calcium pulses in the top. Um, I'm expressing a, a dominant negative allele for uh, a calcium ATPase that I turn on right before uh, constrictions would appear. And below we have a relevant uh, control embryo. And what we'll find is that the, um, this, this uh, 
inhib calcium inhibition removes all the folds in the top red embryo, while the control uh, moves along just fine. So we repeated this many times and saw a clear uh, difference in the ability to form correct folds. And we also um, repeated this with a, uh, a, a different knockdown against a different component of the calcium pathway uh, relating to myosin uh, and ectomyosin contractility, the myosin light chain kinase. So this suggests that this, uh, this calcium is patterning these muscle contractions. So we have this, this picture now in mind, this, uh, this thread from the organ shape, we saw that those were related to convergent extension in the endoderm. That convergent extension on the endoderm is triggered by muscle contractions. And this in turn is, is regulated by this pattern of, of calcium pulses. At the same time, we, we know that these Hox genes uh, that we saw before are ultimate uh, regulators of, of organ shape. So could it be then that the Hox genes are um, controlling the emergence of this pattern of calcium pulses to generate this, uh, this multi-scale multi uh, mechanical program? Um, and indeed, we, this is exactly what we find. So we can trace this thread all the way to the level of, of genes and, and start asking these questions. So if, uh, if um, the antennapedia uh, gene is indeed um, driving this constriction through uh, this, this cascade, then we should expect that there are no calcium pulses that are localized um, at what would be uh, a constriction, but is missing. And so that's what's shown here in the wild type, we have uh, transient calcium pulses near this anterior constriction. And in the intended pedia mutant where we have no such constriction, there is none. And these are both videos that will um, uh, advance to their final shape and the outline. And uh, I'll play this one more time. So in the, in the antennapedia mutant, there's really no uh, calcium activity for an extraordinarily long sustained period of time. This is very robust. Um, so in these antennapedia mutants, we have very little calcium activity um, for over an hour, in fact. Okay, so in short, we've unraveled how a visceral organ transforms uh, shape. We followed morphogenesis that takes hours or an hour to a program of, of high frequency calcium pulses lasting each a second. And we've, we've gone from looking at this, uh, this shape on the scale of hundreds of microns um, now to cellular behaviors and, and even uh, taking a window into genes. And what we find is that indeed there's these Hox genes that control the emergence of these patterned uh, calcium pulses. These are linked to muscle contraction which uh, through mechanical tethering to the endoderm trigger a convergent extension process or tissue shearing. And that tissue shearing we now understand uh, can generate these, these folds to collectively fold an organ into these chambers. Okay, so uh, th these are my conclusions, right? We've done this in toto uh, whole organ, let's say deep tissue imaging to, to really reveal the time course of organ shape change. We found that uh, through the incompressibility of the tissue and the initial geometry, we have a link between in-plane uh, shear deformation and out-of-plane uh, folding. And then we have this mechanical induction between layers that there's muscle contraction triggering the endodermal cell shape change. And this in turn uh, is mediated by this patterned uh, dynamics of calcium pulses that are under the control of Hox genes. To, to generate this mechanical program. So I'd like to, to thank the other folks involved in this work, specifically, especially Dylan Sislo, with whom I um, built the computational and, and analysis tools, and uh, especially my mentors, Boris Schreiman and Sebastian Schreiken. I'd also like to thank uh, another mentor, Zvon Mirdajic, uh, who I've been doing other things with uh, while here in Santa Barbara, and also wonderful discussions and, um, and thoughts from Eric Vichaus. So with that, I'd also like to thank you for your attention. And, and I, I think I have a couple minutes for questions before the chat. Okay, Noah. Thanks for the nice talk and also for the good timing. So um, and, and there are two, uh, two questions right in here, uh, of three now. Uh, the first one, Jonathan asks you, do you think you might make predictions of new organ shapes by changing the initial topology from cylinder, say, to uh, 
uh, toroidal uh, shape. I think this is a very good question, that, similar that I'm asking, maybe uh, uh, you serve the chirality, is the chirality also uh, encoded in the natural shape? Hmm. Um, so the second question, uh, as well, okay, so the first, <laughs> say, say the first <laughs> question, you make new predictions of new organ shapes by changing the topology. Yeah, so then it sounds to me like um, what, what we would really be doing is changing a boundary condition from um, something which is a soft constraint or a soft fixed boundary condition at the anterior and posterior ends of this tube to one which would be periodic then. Um, and uh, I think this would be really in uh, interesting to, to think about, particularly if we can um, uh, uh, finalize a sort of simulation of this, it's something we've been we've been thinking about, and then we can sort of artificially uh, 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 ask these questions about um, what would happen in in more uh, uh, wild changes to the initial geometry. Um, yeah, so I think um, particularly probably during coiling, you would get dramatic uh, changes in in the effects. Um, if you have um, if you have periodic boundary conditions, then um, chirality, um, uh, the space of, of chiral deformations takes a new sort of flavor rather than if you have some fixed boundary conditions, um, then if you were simply a solid, you would have to create perversions and things uh, during the, the coiling. Um, I, I hope that answers somewhat the question, but I think it also, maybe I'll just say that it, it gets at, I, I think this is, is very interesting also from a tissue engineering standpoint that um, it, I, ha I haven't seen something where we have such a direct uh, connection between muscle contraction, sculpting uh, an organ shape. And I think that could be interesting to think more about these design questions. Okay. So um, let me, uh, second question, Amrish. Amrish asks you, you are nicely able to track cell position to see the flow field, but is there a way to determine the forces at play in these uh, complicated geometries? Yeah, this is it's a very nice question, yeah. Yeah, we've been thinking about this a lot. Um, so in, initially, uh, you know, I, so I work here with Boris Schreiman and Boris group has this, a long history and um, um, look, looking at t inferring tensions from epithelial cell junctions. Um, now these, this endoderm is um, a bit messy for that. Uh, there are, uh, it, and, and you also have multiple layers. So just inferring forces in one layer is not guaranteed to give you something meaningful because it's tethered to another. Um, but I do, I do hold some hope for being able to uh, relate the calcium activity to some sort of effective stress generation in, in the active tissue. And so that's a, a direction that, that we've been pursuing to try and um, map a relationship between uh, calcium activity to uh, uh, an effective active stress in the tissue. Mm. So Jinghui Liu asks you, uh, is there a mechanism regulating width of the calcium ring? A ring pulse, let me see, hold on, somehow wrong. Uh, ring pulse pattern. Yeah. This, <laughs> yeah, pulse this is. Pattern regulate, is there, okay. Yeah, is there yeah, this is a, precise, the this calcium is a great, <laughs> oh, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, this is a great question. So we have fairly broad Hox, domains of Hox gene expression. Yet yeah, nonetheless, we have much more precise uh, regions of, of calcium pulses and the regions of, of dramatic, uh, of the, the folding events themselves are, are um, quite confined in, in extent. And that is, an, that is a big question for us. We don't, we don't know how we go from having broad Hox domains, particularly in this anterior fold where the fold forms just in the middle of one of these Hox gene expression domains, the antennapedia domain. So you have something like a 50 micron antennapedia domain, but nonetheless, the, the width of the calcium activity is closer to 20 micron, I mean, a full width half max. So uh, there's some sort of uh, uh, precision which emerges, uh, and we are not sure where that comes from. Uh, this, so that we don't know. It could, it could be that there are, um, that there's more refined patterning that's downstream of Fahox genes. It could be that there is actually more refined patterning in the expression itself that we just haven't, uh, that the community hasn't commented on, that the community hasn't been able to measure, oh, actually there's a gradient in expression 
or something like this, which could give you enough information to really refine that patterning. Okay. So let's pay, uh, take the last question from Lance. Lance, you have long question. Maybe you can just ask yourself uh, directly. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I had I'd sort of uh, a, a couple questions. One was whether um, uh, convergent extension in the underlying endoderm was uh, sort of pa completely passive yeah. or, you know, is it required to get that extra constriction, right? Because I can imagine that the early constriction might not require tissues to remodel, but the later, like as you go down, and, and I saw in your, in your, um, your ectopic constriction that you really didn't get that narrow of a constriction, right? Yes, that's, that's correct. So uh, yeah, this is a wonderful question. Um, yeah, here we, we are uh, in the, I'll just comment on the last technical point, which is in the ectopic constriction on the left here, we're um, generating contractility in the full antennapedia domain rather than in the smaller domain, which we see uh, active in calcium pulses. So it makes sense that our fold is, is not uh, super sharp, crisp. Um, um, as to this, this coupling with the endoderm, this is an, again, another question we've been asking ourselves and, um, and we, we actually pose at the end of, uh, end of our, our preprint, which is how, how much do the endoderm cells um, actively cooperate? We know that given some muscle contraction, uh, they require some muscle contraction to start changing their shape, but they could be sensing this mechanically or, or, or somehow that the muscle cells are starting to contract. Well, now they will in turn follow suit actively to um, undergo conversion extension, or it could be that the muscle is doing all of the work, let's say, mm -hmm. and that uh, it's just sculpting this uh, viscoelastic inner layer. Um, it's, it's a good question. I, there, are, there are cell rearrangements in the inner layer. This is something that we've, we've characterized in the endodermal layer. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's somewhat uh, plastic in the sense, um, the extent to which, uh, I mean, it's also <laughs> quite alive, it's quite active. Yeah. There yeah. are all sorts of um, uh, features that you see there, but um, is it but is you, it that you're applying the force too fast, and you know because these are uh, time, uh, you know, like the viscosity has a has a time scale, the viscosity of the tissue at least, that you're you're going at a at a scale that you know keeps you in the solid like domain and not the fluid like domain. It could be. I th I think over. Over the course of um, the hour, if you, if you think of these constrictions as really taking the full time course to, to go all the way in their true extent, then that gives you enough time for the endodermal cells to change neighbors. Um, uh, not uh, in, in the wild type, again, where we, we characterize this, they change neighbors once on average, right? So that is that a lot? Well, no, not, not per se it's a kind of in this gray area where we really don't know, we don't have a great answer to this question right now, but I think we can probe it using perturbations, using optogenetics and doing some, uh, um, some specific uh, uh, knockdowns in the endoderm layer, if we can get the biology to work, to, to cooperate. Um, 